This is the fourth time that the council has hosted the World Bank to present their report on women business in the law. This morning, I'm delighted to welcome Naida Almodovar. She's from the World Bank. Uh, she joined the World Bank in 2010, and her work is focused on the design of indicators to measure legal barriers for women's economic inclusion. She has also done historical legal research focused on the evolution of labor and family law reforms. Since 2011, she's the topic lead for women business in the laws using property indicator, which focuses in measuring ownership and inheritance rights of women. Her previous experience spans the public and private sectors and includes serving as deputy advisor for the governor of Puerto Rico in the private practice of law. She holds a Juris Doctorate from the Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico and a Master's of Law from the George Washington University School of Law. And with that, I turn it over to Naida. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm delighted to be here um, and uh, very excited to share um, this fifth edition of the Women Business and the Law Report. Um, uh, thank you, Kara, and uh, the organization for hosting us for the fourth time. And uh, it's always very nice to, to come back and, and have a conversation on this topic with, with you all. So um, this morning I wanted to share, to have a conversation uh, around uh, the topic of women's economic inclusion using uh, as our baseline um, the fifth edition of the of the report that we produce at the World Bank. So um, I wanted to basically structure um, uh, an initial presentation of, of the report by sharing with you a bit about the project. I know most of you probably know about the work we do, but um, just wanted to, to share a bit of, of how it became what it is today and then go through the findings that uh, we capture in this uh, cycle of research, including some findings from the Latin America and Caribbean uh, region, um, then uh, go through uh, reforms that we were able to measure and finally uh, share a little bit of how this data set is being used. Um, so um, in 2010, the World Bank's board um, requested that the doing business team, which is a team within our unit that produces uh, one of the flagship uh, reports of the World Bank, um, included a gender lens into the research. So. Uh, that was the genesis of Women, Business, and the Law. And at the time, uh, they um, added some uh, elements to try to measure um, aspects related to uh, hurdles for women's uh, participation in the economic sphere. But they realized that um, based on the laws and the procedures they were measuring, uh, they weren't really capturing much. So uh, that's how Women, Business, and the Law uh, was born. Uh, we've been doing this uh, research and analysis since 2010. As I said, this is the fifth edition of the biannual report. Um, and um, a new element to our work this year is that we included a scoring methodology in uh, our report which is uh, covering now 189 countries and territories worldwide. So we um, incorporated um, this scoring methodology at the indicator level. For us, indicators are basically our uh, main thematic areas that we cover. Um, those are accessing institutions where we look at a legal framework that deals with personal capacity of women. Questions such as can a woman open a bank account, sign a contract, uh, transfer a citizenship, um, get a passport in the same way as a man can. So ba basic transactions that um, everybody has to, to do in, in daily life just to go about personal and, and professional uh, endeavors. Then we also have uh, an, another thematic area that uh, deals with uh, labor restrictions. It's getting a job, 
um, and we look at uh, the legal framework that basically regulates the processes of being able to get a job in the formal sector. Uh, so we ask questions regarding uh, the process of accessing uh, a job. We also look at labor restrictions by sector. We look at uh, aspects related to um, incentives in another indicator such as maternity, paternity, parental leave. That w uh, one of the things that was uh, mentioned earlier, I was um, having an informal conversation with one of our colleagues here. She was mentioning um, an anecdote um, from Panama and, and the hurdles that that they face to, to get three days of paternity leave <laughs> uh, in their law. So that, that's one of the aspects we look at. We also have um, a new, newer area we measure. We started piloting um, indicator on protecting women from violence four years ago, and it's now covering the totality of our, um, of our uh, coverage, and in that area, we measure basically uh, aspects related to sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, in, in education, in public spaces. Uh, we also look at uh, intra-household violence and the existence of laws protecting women from, from that. Um, this, is a, this area in particular um, <clears throat> has been very interesting to develop. When we look at women's economic inclusion, you wouldn't think from the get-go about the topic of violence against women. Um, and, and, and some people ask, what is the relationship between uh, this and economic development and women's capacity to, to enter the workforce? and so on, and there is great correlation. I'm gonna share some uh, findings and information later on in my presentation. We also look at property rights uh, through using property indicator, um, and we look at property as a bundle of rights, not only the capacity to own assets, but also to administer and leverage those assets. Uh, we also look at inheritance rights, and we also look at the existence of protections within marriage for uh, aspects such as the uh, family home um, and also the recognition of non-monetary contributions. These two elements um, in, uh, in principle are gender neutral, but when you look at the impact and outcomes, they benefit women and, and mothers and, and wives. Um, which are the ones that normally stay at home taking care of the children, taking care of the household. So, um, and then we go to the, the last two areas we cover, which are uh, going to court, which looks at things related to access to justice, and a building credit that um, looks at aspects related to uh, reputation collateral and the capacity women have by way of the information collected by the institutions dealing with the credit histories um, for them to be able to, to access financial services and uh, use and leverage their capital, for example, in creating businesses and creating jobs. Um, the way we structure our new scoring methodology is, as I said, at the indicator level, and we score each of the, point, the, the questions or data points we um, look at uh, from uh, zero to 100, zero being worst and 100 being best. Um, and all of this analysis and um, having this uh, angle of economic inclusion when looking at gender um, in itself, um, it's for us has been very um, important because we're able to provide a business case. Uh, we normally look at gender from the human rights perspective, which is um, not only correct but very valid. Uh, but there's also a business case behind the importance of uh, closing the gender gap. Um, we've been able to, to research and find that by including women in the economic sphere, um, 
the impact is not only at present time, but for example, the future generations also see positive benefits from um, this um, studies show, for example, that, that women tend to invest more in, in, in their children's education. Uh, more girls go beyond secondary education when women are included in the economic sphere. There is a study by uh, Mackenzie that basically shows that um, the global gains of gender equality in the workforce at the global level, it's $28 trillion. So but only by including women. That's basically the, the, the impact that the, the globally the, econ the economy has. So it's significant. Um, and that's why we're looking at um, the topic of, of gender with um, a frame of economic inclusion. Not to say that there is not um, a correlation between our work and what's been done from the perspective of the human rights. We actually um, looked a few years ago at, uh, for example, the correlation between the aspects we measure in conjunction with the CEDAW Convention. CEDAW is the Convention uh, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And um, we find that based on the three core principles of CEDAW, which are equality, non-discrimination, and state obligation, basically through our seven areas or uh, indicators, we are basically covering all of the uh, aspects that are basically pillars for, for the CEDAW Convention. And just to give you an example, between the questions we score, we ask, uh, can a woman legally get a job or pursue trade or profession in the same way as a man? That correlates with uh, Article 16 of CEDAW uh, that looks at equality in all matters. Uh, referring to marriage <coughs> and family relations. And we did an exercise of basically matching um, um, our indicators with the convention and there is almost 100% overlap, uh, which um, is also uh, not only interesting but very important because even though our lens is uh, economic inclusion, there is uh, that ad added um, uh, element of being able to provide not only the business case but gender disaggregated data on topics that are relevant for the human rights uh, perspective. Um, having introduced sort of in general our work, let me just uh, share with you five main findings that we capture in this 2018 a Women, Business, and the Law report. Um, these are basically glo global findings. Uh, the first of those being uh, that one in three uh, economies, which are countries or territories we cover, restrict women's freedom of movement or agency. Um, this is quite significant. Um, and when you look at the uh, Areas, for example, that are included included beyond uh, the the global finding, we are looking at things such as applying for for passports. Thirty seven countries have uh, additional requirements for women, and they are not able to apply in the same same way as men. In thirty one countries, by law, women are not able to be head of household. This is very important, especially when trying to get. Uh, basic services, for example, education uh, for the children, health uh, care, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, in 17 countries, women are not allowed to travel outside of their home without permission. And in 11 countries, uh, a basic thing such as an ID card is more difficult for women to get when in comparison to men. Just to give you some examples of the type of uh, restrictions that we identified through our research. <clears throat> Another finding that is quite interesting is that in 18 of the economies, uh, there is still a requirement of permission from the husband for married women to work. What this means is that um, 
they either can't access the job market without having um, the consent of, of, of the husband or the husband is allowed by law to go to an employer and basically said, you are not to hire my wife. So um, we find that this is quite interesting. Um, in the Middle East and North Africa region and in Sub-Saharan Africa is where we see mostly this type of restrictions. Um, in, we look at, at the, the laws that apply at the national level. So these are... Pardon? We only... We, we only look at laws that apply to the majority of the population in uh, the main business city of at the national level. So uh, we don't look at implementation of the law. And it might be that um, there are restrictions in the books that are not being applied in practice and the opposite. There might be uh, equality in the books, but in practice, it might be that there are restrictions that are also applied. Okay. Yes. No, but definitely there are societies and countries that are plural legal also. We measure multiple of those countries where multiple legal systems exist or where, where different legal frameworks apply to different uh, groups within the society. Yeah, but there's a history of closing up information, mm -hmm. example, especially to the United States. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. No, and, and, and in our case, one of the things uh, that it's essential for us is comparability of our data. Uh, we cover 189 countries. Certainly, there are countries that have uh, different realities than others. No, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just sharing with, with all of you the way we, uh, our methodology um, goes somehow around the challenges posed by the different legal systems and the different dynamics of, of the different countries we cover. Uh, we basically look at the national framework and the legal uh, framework that applies to majority of the population. And we look at that at the main business city, which normally is also the capital city, because of our framework of economic inclusion. Um, moving uh, along uh, in, in our findings, when looking at the two previous uh, findings I shared, these are relevant because we've seen that where laws limit women's decision-making abilities, there is uh, a, rate, a lower rate of women, for example, uh, in leadership positions. Um, it's uh, not a causal uh, relationship, but uh, as we've been doing some analysis with our data, it's uh, an interesting finding that we, we were able to draw um, as we were uh, looking at this aspect. Um, the third general global finding I wanted to share is, has to do with property rights. This is an area that um, is very uh, important for women's capacity mm, to um, fully participate in the economic sphere. Uh, for example, property is essential at the time of uh, getting uh, credit and loans because you are able to use it as collateral. But it's also essential uh, when it comes to voice and agency of women. Uh, Intra-household bargaining power is correlated with property rights of women, for example. Um, it, and, and interestingly, we, it, this is one of those areas where we see less movement in reforms because normally uh, property rights are embedded in, um, in either civil codes or types of general legislation that is more difficult to, to change. However, there has been great movement uh, throughout uh, the past 70 years in that area. Um, more than 100 countries 
uh, out of the totality of the countries we measure have been able to reform in this area. However, 75 of the economies still have some restrictions for women's property rights. In most cases, we see that there is a correlation with uh, colonial legacy laws. Uh, in many cases, um, the remnants of, of, of legislation from the times of, of colonial uh, ruling in certain regions um, are still in, in, the, in the laws. Uh, to give you an example, France um, reformed restrictions for women's uh, property rights and in their personal cap capacity in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but we see that uh, in sub-Saharan African countries, there is still, uh, in the Francophone uh, countries from the region, there are still uh, countries where the language of the law is uh, still the same as the code Napoleon that used to rule uh, back in the 50s in, in France. So um, that's one of the elements that uh, uh, influence the legal framework. Uh, but the reality is that there are still restrictions in this area, um, and the impact this has is also relevant. For example, where women um, own less property, they are uh, less likely to hold leadership positions in businesses, for example, to own or manage businesses. We've been doing some analysis using our data with enterprise surveys data, that measures the other side of the coin, which is implementation. And we see that there is a significant correlation between the capacity to own and manage uh, assets and uh, the participation of women in managerial positions in the, in the private sector, for example. Um, the fourth area uh, that uh, draw findings that I, I think were very interesting and I wanted to share is uh, jobs, getting a job. In 104 of the economies we measure, um, there are still restrictions for women to access, access certain sectors or do certain jobs. Um, and this includes industries such as uh, manufacturing, construction, energy, agriculture, water, transportation. Um, and it might be that some uh, can argue that the restrictions are not such, are m meant to be protections, but when we look at the, the specific sectors or, or jobs that are restricted in many cases, um, these are uh, jobs that nowadays are uh, done using high technology, computers, don't require exposure or high exposure to to dangerous situations and are in sectors that uh, are more accessible for women and, and are better paid. So the, th the issue here is, are we pro protecting women or are we preventing them uh, from being able to f compete and fully participate in the economy and at, at least have the choice of entering the different sectors? Um, in, in a region such as uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, it, it's very, very particular. We find, for example, in Russia, they have over 450 professions that are banned for women in the law. And the, those go from being a train driver to uh, driving a truck um, to uh, working in, in textile industry. So you know, these are. Because Russian doctors know that if woman drives from a bus, she has hemorrhoids. It is inevitable for women who drives a bus or truck to have hemorrhoids with time. Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids. That's why mm -hmm. this job can be done. Right. But Russia has history of equality in service. And why it is a woman who have hard work mm -hmm. then she cannot have a child. Mm. Like here. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. It is bond, it is not political reasons, but health reasons. It, it could be argued in that way. Men are probably in also the United States you take school children from garden to vegetable store because they don't know vitamins. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, it's it's an, a valid argument. We would say to that that um, if, if it's the case, uh, the 
the, probably the solution is not to exclude half of the population from being able to access the sector, but rather modify the circumstances in which all workers, including men and women, are, are performing the job so that they are protected from the potential hazards of, of doing, doing the, the task. Um, and in, 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 in that line of thought, provide for all the option of being able to access uh, the, the, the sector. So, uh, and, and globally, um, it's, it's uh, an area where we've seen that uh, countries have started to move towards that, uh, towards um, reforming their laws, understanding that the solution is not in excluding, but rather in uh, taking care of the underlying uh, concerns uh, that include health, pr protecting uh, workers, uh, health-wise, safety reasons, and, and all of that. Right. Um, it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's an area. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't. Get Oh, okay, but well, going going to the to the particular element that 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 we are covering here, which is a legal framework uh, and and job restrictions, we 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 measure and we find that globally um, in many countries there are still this type of restrictions with the impact it has in in the economic inclusion of women. Um, and of course, there is a correlation that we draw using these findings, and uh, it's a norm, a, a, a very logical uh, correlation where you res uh, remove restrictions. You have not only a higher rate of women joining the labor force, but also a higher rate of women getting better paid jobs, which are the two uh, scatter plots that I'm sharing here. Uh, the left one it has to do with participation. The right one. Comments to the end because I no, think I the presentation is super long, and we should just, no, if you don't mind, question. holding your comments to the end. No, I have a question. Sure. Okay, there is uh, income, men and women, let's say, in the family. Mm -hmm. But both the psychological effect. How does it affect people in the family psychologically? who earns more women and men. And if it is such a tendency that men, from one side, want women who uh, make some money uh, to help the family, but from the other side, men resist, women make more money than he. Or it is individually, or it is by classes in American society. What's the psychological issue? I, I think I'm going to defer to the group to have that conversation after we finish presenting the, the findings, because we are, research is limited to the legal framework. What you're talking about is outcomes, cultural and, and social uh, aspects of the dynamics of countries, and that is outside of the scope of uh, this research. We, That's, that's far out the scope, off, out of the scope of this presentation. Yeah, and Nida, could you please continue? Sure, I'm sure. really curious to know about Latin of course, America of here. course, of course. That's why we're really here? <laughs> of course. So the final, be, before I go to to uh, Latin America and the findings in the region, the final general finding uh, I wanted to share has to do with uh, protecting women from sexual harassment at work. Uh, lately, we've seen a, a great momentum uh, in the discussion of this topic. There's the Me Too movement and, and many other aspects. Uh, as I said, we've been measuring uh, the, from the legal uh, perspective the topic of sexual harassment and protections within the law for the past four to six years. Um, interestingly, uh, we find that still 59 countries worldwide do not prohibit in their laws uh, sexual harassment at work, uh, which is uh, quite a uh, high number if you ask me. Um, 
And uh, of course, the impact this has is uh, uh, evident. Where sexual harassment is prohibited, we find that there are more women in entrepreneurship and also in the workforce. Um, it's, a, it's a, again, not a causal analysis, but it's a, a very interesting finding when you uh, look at the topic from the perspective of the data. Um, globally, the um, High-income OECD countries perform, uh, in average, uh, the highest in all of our indicators. Um, and we see that Latin America and the Caribbean um, uh, has interesting numbers there. So I want to go into the findings for the region. And I'm going to share three specific findings that we find very interesting. The first one has to do with the area of reputation collateral and uh, what's being measured uh, when it comes to credit history in, in the region. We find that 40% of the economies in Latin America and the Caribbean scored zero in this indicator, um, wow. which means that aspects related to repayment of utilities, microcredit, and others that are normally um, more helpful for women at the time of proving that they have a solid credit history um, are not included in the information that is being captured by the institutions that, that uh, are uh, reporting this information. Most of those uh, economies are in the Caribbean region. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's also valid to say that uh, the average for the region is 41%, which is not too bad in comparison to other regions. Still, there is room for improvement in this area, particularly because when we talk about uh, reputation collateral, that's directly associated or uh, relevant for women entrepreneurs. They rely a lot on being able to access financial services in order to establish their businesses and continue growing their businesses. So this is an area where the region has room for improvement. Um, the second finding for the region that I wanted to share has to do with um, incentives for women uh, workers, and uh, particularly with paid uh, maternity leave. Um, in this area, um, less than half of the countries in, in the LAC region meet the ILO minimum standard of at least 14 weeks of paid maternity leave, um, which is the equivalent to 98 days uh, of maternity leave. Needless to say that there are uh, also room f uh, for improvement when it comes to paternity leave and to incorporate a new trend, which is parental leave, which is a joint uh, hybrid between maternity and paternity, which uh, gives the flexibility to both parents to decide, decide how they distribute the time that is allocated for this leave between them. And, and in, in many countries, it's starting to be the option um, uh, that it's being pushed forward. Scandinavian countries are uh, leaders in that. Um, in the region, uh, a quarter of economies recently reformed. When we look at the reformed uh, tendencies between our previous cycle and uh, this current cycle in Latin America and the Caribbean, we, we saw that, for example, in maternity leave, there was a great movement in increasing the number to meet the standards. So that's very uh, uh, positive. Um, and other uh, restrictions uh, that were repealed and are worth highlighting, for example, in Colombia, the constitutional court struck down uh, job restrictions on women's employment. Um, and uh, in Ecuador, on the property right side, it was the only economy out of the 189 that reformed in that area repealing a provision that favored husband's decision when administering assets within marriage um, if there was um, disagreement between the spouses. So, so now uh, both opinions, uh, husbands and wife, are legally um, valued the same. Um, in other economies, uh, maternity leave was increased, uh, Colombia, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Paraguay are examples of those. And as uh, it was highlighted recently, Panama introduced the three days of, of paid 
paternity leave, which is way more than what men have in the U.S., needless to say, women, uh, because there is no paid maternity leave in the U.S. Uh, so um, very interesting findings for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, moving along, um, this is a good set way to share uh, global reforms. And uh, we find that in uh, 65 countries, uh, there were 87 positive reforms uh, to increase women's economic inclusion and reduce the legal gender gap. Um, throughout the 10 years of work we've been uh, developing this uh, product, um, the trend continues to be positive. There has been uh, some countries that have made some regressive reforms, but those are minimal. In the areas we cover, most of the reforms we capture uh, are positive, and they happen in all regions. Um, and uh, interestingly, in, in, in recent times, uh, not only through traditional media, but also social media has been a great tool to disseminate these changes and, and to be a vehicle of inclusion in the conversation for, for everyone. And here we have some examples of highlights in all languages of different countries that reform. <coughs> Overall, South Asia is the, the region with the highest percentage of reform, uh, reforming economies. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean as OECD high-income high economies have less reforms because in most of the areas we cover, they've already closed the, the gap in the law. That's not to say that there aren't issues in practice and, and implementation, but as I had mentioned before, we only measure uh, the legal framework and the reality in, in the books. We are not uh, saying that this is uh, applicable in the outcomes and implementation side. Um, finally, I wanted to share how uh, our work is being used. We're mainly in four aspects. Uh, number one, identifying good practices. Uh, having historical data has allowed us to see how countries have been moving towards reform, and we've been able to share these trends and the research we do with groups uh, that include not only um, policymakers but also civil society in different countries. Um, we've done workshops and peer-to-peer -peer learning events in multiple regions. Here you have some pictures from events in Africa that we hold in the past year and a half. Uh, sharing this information, create building capacity and creating uh, spaces in which uh, different countries are able to share experiences and uh, um, work on developing um, the capacity of their leadership and also um, this, the grassroots groups that work in the topic. <clears throat> we also uh, provide uh, good evidence for a business case of gender um, and equality of opportunity um, through reforms definitely unleashes women's full potential. Uh, more women um, able to work um, benefit by way of uh, experiences, uh, experiencing these reforms in their countries. And of course, as I've shared in previous slides, there is definitely an economic impact. Um, one of the examples that it's, was very interesting for us um, in um, a couple of years ago, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, with the assistance of the World Bank and a team including uh, members from Women, Business and the Law team, uh, worked in um, providing support in the process of the reform of the family code of, of the uh, DRC. Um, and they were able to adopt a new code that eliminated restrictions such as the one for women trying to become entrepreneurs and register their, their own businesses. Previously, women needed uh, consent from their husbands or male uh, tutors to be able to go to the registry and open a business and, and, and go through the process. This is an actual letter uh, from a husband of a lady that my colleague Tassin Hassan met in Cote d'Ivoire at the registry. Madame Ngozi was there trying to register her business and one of the documents that was required and she had to produce was the letter 
from her husband giving her permission to, to go through the process and register her business. Thankfully, if she, was, uh, if she were to go today to, to register her business, uh, she's no longer required to produce this type of letter. Um, just to, to give an example of how uh, reforming the laws in the books have a real impact in, in practice. Uh, quick question, if you're single, um, what kind of capacity do you have to register a business? In DRC, uh, nowadays they have full capacity. In countries such as Tongo, the, uh, Tonga, they still don't have the full capacity. So, so it's, it's nothing if you're single and if you're married you have to have permission? Interestingly, in uh, one of the main things that we, we noticed from the get-go was that in most of the countries of the world, single women have full capacity, but they give up rights at the time of marriage. So it was, the, and that's why we've been able to um, modify our tools of research to cover things such as the marital property regimes, because it is within marriage where we see that the, the hurdles appear. Is there a correlation with divorce? Um, we've not, we, we've not done that uh, analysis. Um, so that's a question I, I cannot answer. Um, and uh, it's also uh, worth mentioning that we are not, um, uh, with our research, we are not putting forward an argument for or against marriage. We are just shedding light on the reality, the objective reality uh, of how laws are around the world. And um, one fact is that we've, we've seen that uh, it is of a marriage where uh, some of the rights are given up. Um, as I said, in, nowadays, Tonga is the only country where single women are restricted uh, from doing most of the transactions we measure. Uh, um, but all other countries we measure uh, give full rights to single women. Um, and I'm going to leave you with our website, uh, wblworldbank.org. Um, there you'll be able to download the full uh, report, um, edition fifth and previous editions. I've brought with me, and I see most of you have them, copies of the key findings. I invite you to go to our website and, and check out the full report. And we also cover additional information that is not included in the report. We have country profiles. You can download data, do analysis at the country level regional level, by income group, um, by indicator. Um, and I uh, also share with you hashtags that um, we are using um, through social media to uh, disseminate the work. So I invite you if, you, if you're interested in following us on Facebook, uh, we are at Women Business and Law, Women Business Law. And uh, through Twitter, you, if you want to share the information that we uh, shared today, uh, do so using the hashtag WomenBizLaw or get to equal. Uh, at this point, I think I'm going to stop. And I'm looking forward to, to the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Naida, for, for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> for the Q&A portion of the program, I have two requests. First. Um, if you have a question, I please ask you to, for you to use the microphone um, so we can all hear and so we can capture it on the video. Uh, and, and also, I just ask that, that we keep the questions uh, focused on, on the legal framework and, and the issues raised in today's presentation. So, and short. And, and short. So I'm going to start with, with a question. This is something that came up. Uh, at our conference last week with the Vice President of Panama, and I, I noticed it in your presentation as well, and I'm just curious, the indicator which looks at the, the retirement age for women, why is that important? And what, what impact do we see in countries where it's different for, for men versus women? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question. Retirement ages, and uh, not only that, but pension schemes, uh, are especially important for, for women. Normally, women have to take off from work uh, throughout their professional life in multiple occasions. We all know that um, 
when when women have children, they take off to take care of relatives. They they might take time off, and um, having a shorter life cycle in the professional scheme that impacts the pension that they will have for when they are elder um, is very important. If you have a shorter life in your professional career um, and you accrue less than men accrue by way of the, of the legal scheme that applies to, to your retirement and pension, um, you're left with, you're left with uh, less uh, for your retirement. Um, and um, there are studies that show that women live more than men. So their uh, lifespan during that retirement period, uh, it's probably longer than men's, but they are um, potentially left with less money to cover their life expenses throughout their uh, retirement. Um, this is an area that we are looking at with um, a special interest. There is uh, specific research being done by, by colleagues within our team on pensions. It is not included in the report, but we will launch a standalone uh, topic note on pensions and benefits for uh, women in their elder age uh, throughout uh, the coming months. And there will be more information and analysis. Uh, we've rolled out um, a pilot in 100 countries looking specifically at this topic. So we'll be able to share that in the coming uh, months, uh, half a year or so. Uh, but definitely uh, an area to consider um, because it correlates a lot with uh, quality of life mm -hmm. of women. Uh, I think the United States is one of the countries measured within the pilot, um, and we look at countries in all the regions. Yes. Yes, and and that's that, and that's precisely um, not only in the United States. We've seen that in many countries in in all regions of the world, the average difference between a mandated retirement age between men and women is of five years. So. Um, so women are mandated to retire five, five years earlier than men. Um, and with what you mentioned. And in Russia, Russia gives permanent women one year more, and employers pay because employers take employers. Right. And in the United States, they don't pay any employers for the child pay. Fully paid. Fully paid, yeah. Do we have any other questions? I'll be calling on people here. Sure. Yes, besides, thank you very much for your presentation. And besides your website, which are the paths you take to inform uh, the opinion makers, the lawmakers, which are the ways people can know about your work? We. Um, the way we operate is uh, on cycles of 24 months. So we take one year to produce our, our data, um, and that year ends with the launch of the biennial report. The subsequent year is used basically to disseminate. Um, also, we work in parallel on expanding our, our areas of research and doing other uh, minor uh, product projects, developing, developing uh, topic notes and case studies and such. But we go uh, around an, in what we call a roadshow which has launch events of the report in all regions of the world. Uh, we present our work before institutions such as the UN. We go before uh, high commissions at the, at the state and gl regional global levels. Um, we disseminate in meetings with academics. We work with private sector and, uh, for example, all of our legal experts um, uh, are sort of ambassadors of the work we do by way of uh, not only contributing but 
uh, disseminating also within their countries the work we do. Last cycle, we were able to do uh, over 200 events worldwide uh, disseminating the work. That uh, doesn't mean that more can be done. Uh, of course, there are challenges for us to be able to reach everyone, um, but we are working also with um, colleagues in different CSOs, uh, civil society groups, and NGOs that are using our data in their own research and are also becoming ambassadors of this work by disseminating and uh, plugging in women, business, and the law in their events. <clears throat> so um, there, is, uh, there are multiple avenues that we uh, constantly use and seek uh, to open. Um, this event is uh, an example of another important avenue uh, for us, which is sharing uh, with a group uh, such as you uh, the work we do and uh, hope that you will, uh, you will be able to, to then use our work and share it um, with your constituencies. Um, and basically, that's, that's the work we are doing. There is also um, work being done within the bank. It's already being, uh, our work, it's already being incorporated in projects that the bank is doing at the country level. Um, a few years back, the bank incorporated our indicators through the scorecard of the World Bank, which means that now gender, by way of these indicators, is one of the elements considered at the time of uh, going about approving and, and, and going forward with different projects. Um, adding to that, in this past couple of years, the bank has uh, reinforced their, their commitment to, to gender by adopting um, an official uh, institutional gender strategy. And now in all projects uh, that the bank is um, doing, there is a requirement of incorporating a gender component to it. This, this is basically <clears throat> um, a way of, of going to the next step in, in terms of um, looking at gender as a, a key element of, in this case, economic inclusion. Can you use the microphone, please? Can you use the, the microphone? Thank you. Push it up. Push the little bit of it up, the little thing in the center. Okay, I'm just noticing you have an Instagram account called World Bank, mm -hmm. and unfortunately there is only over 200 followers. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? Is it just open recently? Uh, I'm not sure which one. World Bank. Uh, mm, I, I, it's not, we do, as, uh, as a project. No, 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 no. Pardon me, <coughs> 262K. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds better. That sounds more like it. Right, right. Um, right. So it's been obviously for a while then? It, no, that's the general World Bank uh, Twitter account. Okay. Um, we had a launch event on the 29th. I'm actually on Instagram. Wonderful, wonderful. And we invite you, if you, if you think our work is worth yeah. disseminating, to retweet and, and, mm -hmm. and share our work um, using the hashtags that I shared. Um, one of the things, um, and, and we are now, uh, and this uh, correlates with the question the colleague posed, uh, <clears throat> we definitely know that uh, there are new avenues that are uh, essential uh, to, to the process of dissemination, social media being one of them. So in the past couple of years, we've been particularly intentional in trying to have more presence. Um, on uh, April 20, on uh, the 29th of March, for example, we had an official launch of the report. Um, we were able to, to live stream the event. Um, it was uh, basically a presentation done by the CEO of the World Bank Group, Kristalina Georgiova, and our manager, uh, Sarah Iqbal. Um, and uh, we had simultaneous uh, live stream and tweeting. Um, during the time frame of the event, uh, we were number two global trending oh. topic, um, uh, women biz law. 
uh, which for us is very important because that means that more people, especially in that demographic of maybe teens to 30s, which is uh, as important as all other demographics, but sometimes less, uh, or we, we, we don't necessarily have as much access to. Uh, because of the nature of the work we do. Uh, but we think that um, having presence in social media will, will allow us to be exposed to more, more people. And definitely, uh, we do have a Facebook account, and I'm, I'm very proud to say that we went from 7,000 followers in the previous cycle to close to 50,000 in, in the past couple of years. So um, our, our expertise is not social media, but we are putting a lot of effort in trying to incorporate uh, the use of this tool in our strategy to disseminate our work. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If, well, I, we if I can say something, I think it would be, you pass me the microphone? It would be great to have like the, um, the ideal so that people could see what the ideal is in the women business and the law. And I don't know if you use a, a Norwegians or somebody in Scandinavia who seem to have the ideal legal regulatory framework so that everybody mm. around the world can know what they can aspire to mm. and maybe measure how long it might take them mm -hmm. to get there, if at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, definitely. And, and that's a very interesting comment. Um, there are two things here. Um, <clears throat> as, as, as I mentioned before, we're moving towards facilitating the process of, at a glance, identifying what are areas of opportunity for reform uh, at the indicator level. Uh, we don't have a global scoring. Uh, we don't rank countries. Um, so in that sense, our intention is to basically provide an additional tool to do what you, you mentioned, which is look at where we can improve. And this um, is relevant to all countries. We find that 90% uh, of the economies uh, we measured in our cycle 2016 had at least one legal gender difference. That's most of the world and in all regions, including high income economies, developing countries, uh, all levels. Um, ideal, we have to qualify that because as the colleague here um, was uh, pointing out, there is the reality in the books, but there is also the reality in implementation. Right. Um, and for us to say, that this is the ideal model, has, we have to be a bit cautious about not, um, about how we, we go about sending that message because uh, again, we recognize the fact that we're only one piece of the puzzle. Um, having said that, there's certainly, um, there are certain uh, countries that have improved their legal framework um, to a, a point of almost having a perfect score. But I have to say in all countries there is still room for improvement because they, there are still areas that don't uh, have equality. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting um, exercise. I think as we continue developing our project and our product, we might get to a point where we are in a position to, to, to graduate to that level of saying this is kind of like the referent. Uh, but for now, I think having that scoring methodology available is uh, one step uh, further to facilitate the process of ident identifying uh, not only where countries are uh, and what are the areas where they can work on, but also to look at neighbor countries or s countries with similar circumstances and see where they are and see what they've done, what, what they've been able to achieve. Um, sometimes uh, the solutions don't, don't require to reinvent the wheel. It's just a matter of looking at what's been done by neighbors and others and perhaps adapting. So we work a lot um, on building capacity in that sense and that's why we've invested time and, and efforts, uh, particularly the past couple, couple of years in doing the peer-to-peer -peer workshops. 
and uh, building capacity workshops at the, at the country level. So I have a follow-up question to that. Sure. If you had a magic wand and you could implement one regulation, one law in every country in the world that having to deal with women's economic inclusion, what would be the one thing you would change and implement on a global scale that would have the greatest impact on women's economic inclusion? Well, I think we have to look at it from the perspective of the actual reality of how law operates. And when we look at laws from that perspective, definitely the overarching umbrella is always the Constitution. So having sound provisions against discrimination by gender and also equality provisions at the constitutional level that are not only there, but of course outside of the scope of what we measure, that are really being uh, applied not only in practice, but by modifying the laws be below that constitution to make those laws comply with the provisions in the constitution, I think that would be the entry point. Um, because it's a natural progression when you look at uh, how to, to reform. Like you want to go from the overarching okay. and drill down. Great. So we've, oh, we've got a couple questions over here with the microphone. Yes. Uh, which uh, country in Latin America was the most challenging for you? Challenging in what sense? In terms of finding uh, the, the, the data for women. I have to say, uh, for us, uh, the island nations in the Caribbean. Um, because, um, first of all, we included this set of uh, countries this cycle. So we were building uh, from scratch. So to be able to get the information, we had to develop the network of local legal experts. And that required a lot of uh, effort. Um, I am from the Caribbean. I'm um, born and raised in Puerto Rico. So I uh, can speak with personal knowledge about uh, what island time is. Um, in the Caribbean, things move at a different pace. Um, and, uh, and that is at all levels. So um, that was a challenge that I anticipated personally but uh, certainly was there for my team to tackle down. Um, thankfully, we were able to, to secure the commitment of uh, key legal experts in the region, in the, in the, in the islands that were very helpful. Um, in general, um, when we talk about um, South America, Central America, uh, we've been doing the research for a this is the fifth cycle already, including the countries in, in continental uh, America, from north to south. Um, um, and we already have a solid network. Uh, so the process of gathering information was easier uh, for us in that sense. We have one more question over here. Uh, well, recently I've read a lot about the importance of increasing uh, gender diversity in company boards of directors. And uh, well, I think people are more and more concerned about it, and especially investors. And I would like to know if the World Bank has done any um, studies or collected data on that, and uh, how can it in actually improve the quality of business management? We actually collect the uh, data in our uh, research uh, from the perspective of the law uh, on uh, legal provisions uh, mandating the inclusion of uh, women at the corporate level in, in corporate board. We also do it at other levels in, for example, the judiciary, at um, national banks, in parliaments. Um, there, uh, when you look at it, there is a sector that um, um, is hesitant about it. What we've seen is that um, having a balance um, when it comes to the discussions around uh, the process of decision making has never been uh, uh, has never shown to be non-beneficial. Um, 
And in that sense, when we launched a couple of weeks ago, our CEO, um, Kristalina Kyrgyova, was sharing personal experiences as uh, high-level women in, 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 in her career, working at the level of CEO of the World Bank Group, for example, um, and, and, and the dynamics that arise from having the perspectives that are put forward by men and women in the process of decision making um, are clearly um, robust in, in, in making sure that decisions are sensitive to everyone. Um, and in that sense, uh, we look at um, legal provisions in, in, in these aspects. Um, I think it was uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, that countries such as Norway uh, implemented a, a, a voluntary provision of inclusion of women um, in high-level uh, decision-making positions at the corporate level. Um, they weren't able to meet the, the threshold. Eventually, the law was reformed, and they made it mandatory, and they exceeded the numbers. And, um, and we all know that uh, Norway and the Scandinavian uh, countries have become referenced in, in, in things rela related to inclusion of women. So um, there is data. At the level of the World Bank, we've uh, not only done the research, but um, internally um, the decisions have been adopted to also achieve that balance by mandating the inclusion of women at highest levels of management. We are one woman away from meeting the, the threshold right now. Um, and uh, so the bank is not only doing the research, but it's also um, implementing um, inside of the institution uh, what they are uh, s identifying as uh, basically ideal practices in this sense. Yes, I'd like to know. Um, this in reference to the World Bank and women's uh, issues and things that, how is Mexico rated? Actually, Mexico, within Latin America, from the perspective of the law, which is what we measure, uh, is one of the countries that have been able to achieve uh, a highest level of, of legal equality. And actually, when we look at the region, I think Mexico is one of the countries, if not the country with the highest score uh, at the regional level. Uh, so there has been great uh, movement towards reform, uh, the laws in the books. Um, and uh, when we launched a couple of weeks ago, it was interesting to see that um, at the regional level, I, at the coverage that our launch and the fifth edition of the report got was significantly higher than what we capture in other countries in Latin America. And I think it's in part because they are paying attention, um, close attention to works such as the one we are doing. Did you measure it before? Pardon? Uh, can you repeat the question? Did you measure it equality before Mexican petroleum was sold to United States? a year ago or after. What do you mean Mexican petroleum was sold to the United States? I just was in Mexico City before election of the president, and everybody knows in Mexico about it. About what? That a year ago, Mexican petroleum, president of Mexico, a year ago, sold Mexican petroleum to the United States. We measure I, our... I disagree with that, Miriam. People are here from the Mexican consulate. <laughs> I disagree with that comment. No, I, I, I <laughs> Maybe Mexican consulate hides something about no, Mexico. I don't think so. <laughs> let, me, let me say um, that, again, that's a question I cannot answer because we don't look at uh, that aspect. We measure, we measure all of our countries. Uh, we've been doing our research since 2010, so we look at the laws that apply to the different areas we measure in the countries um, at the national level. In federal uh, states, in countries with which 
which are a federal system, we look at in, in uh, at the main business city and the laws that apply to that city. In the case of Mexico, we look at the uh, federal district law, but we've been measuring Mexico since 2010. It, it's one of the countries that was incorporated uh, since the beginning of our research. Uh, again, we don't look at uh, anything other than the reality in the books uh, on the laws that apply to the areas that we cover on gender uh, and women's economic inclusion. I'd like to give people another opportunity to ask a question. Are there any other questions? I have a question. I know, I'd like to give other people an opportunity to ask that haven't Can had an opportunity yet. One? Anyone else have a question? Down there? Did you have a question? No? Here. Okay. Would you like the mic, please? Um, you mentioned that uh, the World Bank is considering uh, your research and taking an institutional gender strategy approach. Could you say a little bit more about the areas in which you are applying gender and your research, well, your research, sorry, to the gender uh, strategy of the World Bank? Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of years ago, the institutional organization of the bank, the structure of the bank um, was modified and now, uh, the bank is organized by global practices instead of by regions, the way it operates, but there are uh, some uh, overarching themes that are applicable to all um, of the practices, one of those being gender. So we have what we call the gender CCSA, which is the cross-cutting solution area. Um, and the gender CCSA uh, developed uh, strategy applicable to uh, all the global practices um, that essentially what it uh, puts forward is a guideline on how different areas, projects can implement as they are developing their, their specific uh, strategy for implementing a project, a gender lens. So basically, for example, if we're talking about a project in the water sector, transportation sector, um, education, um, or any of the other areas uh, that uh, is a global practice of the bank, they uh, developed a guideline that helps our technical uh, specialists going in the field uh, to do work and implement projects to be able to look at the, at the work they are doing with a gender lens. This is, an, and in practice you might ask, but how, how is this done? It's not that they are doing a gender project, but when they are doing a project, they have to think about how the project works from the perspective of gender. And they have to take measures um, to ensure that any impact that the project might have in um, somehow affecting negatively uh, based on gender is removed from the project. So uh, that's how it's been done. At the, at the broader level, I mentioned also that a few cycles back, the World Bank incorporated some of our indicators in the scorecard that the bank uses to analyze each uh, proposal for a project. So now gender is one of those categories that is looked at and they do it by looking at our, some of our indicators and how countries are doing in, in those in the process of analyzing the, pro the projects that they will approve and implement. Sure. And with that, we've, we've run out of time for our program this morning. I want to thank Nida for, for coming and, and sharing your thoughts, sharing the, the research. Uh, we do have a few more uh, copies of the key findings out, outside on the, on the table out here. Um, I encourage you guys to continue the conversation um, at, to hear as, as after the, the program. Uh, be sure to, to follow Women, Business, and the Law on all their social media networks. And uh, please join us in Sao Paulo on May 23rd and in New York on October 11th for the Women's Hemispheric Network. Thank you so much.